you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. A gang of clever thieves are at work in your city. In three months, they've looted fashionable homes of $100,000 in furs and jewels. There's no clue to their identity. Your job? Get them. In Fatima, the difference is quality. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest domestic and Turkish varieties, extra mild. Superbly blended to give you Fatima's much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, round, perfect Fatima cigarettes. Rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Manufactured in the newest and most modern of all cigarette factories. Quality. Even to the appearance of the bright, clean, golden yellow Fatima package. So compare Fatima yourself. Today, you'll find Fatima gives you all the advantages of extra length plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. Yes, light up a Fatima. Your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Because in Fatima, the difference is quality. Dragnet the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, January 10th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Wisdom. My name's Friday. It was 11.15 a.m. when we got back to the city hall. Captain Wisdom's office. Hi, Skipper. Hi. How'd you make out? Not too good. Same old story. Anybody in the house when the thieves broke in? Yeah, the children's nurse was there. She said the burglary took place about midnight. She was asleep in bed at the time. Uh Uh-huh. The nurse said she woke up when she heard the thieves forcing their way in through a side door. She jumped out of bed, ran for the telephone in the hallway, and they grabbed her before she could reach it. Do her any harm? Well, a little, yeah. They tied her up, locked her in a closet. Same M.O. as the other job, Skipper. Three men, each of them wore gloves and a mask. They took all the furs and jewelry they could find, nothing else. Nurse give you the same general description on the three of them? Yeah, it's not going to help much. Said two of the men were tall, medium build, and one was short, heavy build. She was so rattled she couldn't even remember the clothes they had on. Twelve jobs with the same gang in three months. We don't even have a good description of them. How slow can we move? Doing everything we can, Skipper. Uh, excuse me. Burglary wisdom. Uh-huh. Not until two o'clock? No, that's all right. Two o'clock sharp. Right. Bye. Just had an appointment canceled out. How about a cup of coffee downstairs? Yeah. I didn't even have a chance for breakfast this morning. Fine with me. You grab my hat, will you? Yeah, I'll get it. Here you go. Thanks. Guess you talked to the owners of the house, huh? The place was broken into last night? Yeah, we did. Uh, Mr. and Ms. Peterson. They got home a couple hours after the burglary. Took a quick inventory. What did they find missing? Furs and jewels, same as the other jobs. Almost $12,000 worth. That's the biggest haul yet. I don't have to spell it out for you. We need a break on this thing. We need it bad. More pressure from the front office, huh? It's coming from all sides. The victims are insurance companies and newspapers. They got a right to cry. Those thieves have been grabbing furs and jewels for three months. We're doing everything about it we can do, Skipper. Planning stakeouts, working our informants, running down every lead we can get our hands on. Covered every angle I can think of. They don't worry about the angles we cover. They want results. They want their property back. Yeah, go ahead, Skipper. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Now, how about the stuff they took on the job last night? You get it on the stolen property list? Yeah, it's all listed. That's one thing that really gets me. Mm-hmm. What are the thieves doing with all that stuff, the furs and the jewelry? We've had every pawn shop in the city on the alert since they started working. Checked on every possible outlet we know of, any place they could use to dump the stuff. They haven't turned up a trace of it. No results from those APBs you got out? Well, yeah, a few, but none of them are panned out. How about trying the cafeteria here? They got pretty good coffee. Yeah, that's a good idea. Why don't you two grab a table? I'll get the coffee. Right, Ben. Oh, uh, hold the cream on mine, will you? Right, Skipper. How's this? Is this all right, Skipper? Yeah, it's fine. Three chairs? Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, how about it, Friday? You or Ben got any ideas at all? Well, there's one thing we wanted to talk over with you. We were kicking the idea around on the way back into the office. Uh -huh. Would you like a smoke? Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. There you go. Last night, we were comparing the different stories we got from the burglary victims. Yeah, like... Thank you. You get a light, all right? Yeah, it's all right, thanks. Go ahead. Well, that's one thing that all their stories seem to have in common. Now, that's counting all 12 victims. Yeah, what's that? Well, let's see. I got a piece of paper here. I got it all figured out. Yeah. We know all the victims are fairly wealthy people. They go out quite a bit, parties, nightclubs, things like that. Yeah. None of them were at home at the time the burglaries were pulled. That's right, yeah. Here you go. There's your skipper. No uh, cream, Joe. Thank you very much. I was just telling the captain about that idea we were talking about on the way back in. Yeah, oh, yeah. All right, so none of the victims were home at the time of the burglary. Where does it go from there? Well, for one thing, we all pretty much agree that there must be a finger man working with the gang, don't we? Somebody who knows the victims aren't home. Somebody who also knows the victims aren't wearing the furs or jewels on that particular night. Is that right? That's right. We've been going on that assumption. Now, the question is, who's the finger man? Well, that's what I'm trying to get at here. Ben and I compared the victims' stories. We found out that in every case, each of the victims had been out in some public place from three to five days before the night of the burglary. Right. Now, at that time, every one of them wore furs and expensive jewelry. Yeah. Well, why don't you read off some of those examples we got there, Joe? Okay. Well, here's the first one. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Charles King. Now, on December 10th, they went to a nightclub out in Hollywood. Mrs. King wore a fur coat and quite a bit of jewelry. On December 14th, they went out to a theater. They didn't dress up at all. They left the furs and jewels at home. Now, that's the night that their house was burglarized. And the same pattern shows up in every one of the victim's stories? No. No, it's not quite that close, but the same elements seem to be there. Yeah, here's another one, Skipper. Let's see. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lyons. November 20th, they went to a big party at a restaurant out on Sunset. Woman wore jewelry, expensive fur wrap. A week later, they went to a party at a friend's house. Mrs. Lyons left her furs and jewelry at home. And the same night, the thieves broke in. Yeah, that's a pretty good angle. How do you tie up all the loose ends? Well, I can see a paper again, Ben. We've got it halfway figured right here. Just before each of the victims was taken, they appeared in a public place wearing the furs and jewelry. We've got a list of all the places, nightclubs, restaurants. There's about six of them here. So the finger man for the gang must be watching these six places. He spots the people with the expensive furs and jewelry and tips off the gang. They watch the house. Next time the people go out and the thieves see the woman isn't wearing her furs and things, and they move in. It's not a sure thing. We're just guessing, you understand? What do you think? Well, it sounds like a fair guess. Let's move on it. We'll have to cover each of those nightclubs and the restaurants. It's going to take more men, more time. Could be nothing but a blind alley. We got the men, we got the time. Let's try it. 10 p.m., Wednesday, January 10th. Our idea for stopping the burglary gang by reaching their spotter or finger man was put into operation. The half dozen nightclubs and restaurants where we thought the spotter might be checking off richly dressed couples as future burglary victims were placed under strict surveillance. Managers and employees of each of the places were questioned. It went slow. The first week got us four leads to check out. They led nowhere. Any and all suspicious looking persons loitering in or near the clubs and restaurants that we had staked out were questioned and checked out thoroughly. Another week passed, no results. In the meantime, on January 23rd, the burglary gang hit again, this time at a dentist's home in the Hollywood Hills. The maid, a Miss Ilsa Bergstrom, was the only one present at the time of the burglary. Ben and I drove out to interview her. It was soon before midnight. The Mr. and Mrs. was gone out ever sitting with the television. The three men broke in the side door, is that right, Miss Bergstrom? Yeah, the side door, I think so. Ever sitting with the television watching. I hear this sound, I turn around, and the three men, they're right there in the room with me. I thought I could scream, but I couldn't. Well, do you remember what the men looked like, Miss Bergstrom? How they were dressed? I don't know. I was so much being frightened. One of them had a jacket on, I think. Dark jacket. Hmm. The others, I don't know. Anything else about them that you noticed? Yeah, they had masks all over their faces. I couldn't see. I jumped up. I tried to scream, but I was so much frightened. What'd they do then, Miss? Well, they put a cloth all around my mouth so I couldn't make noise. Then they tied my hands and my feet, and they put me in the closet out there. Just about the hallway. I was kicking and hitting at them. Mm -hmm. Had you ever seen any of the men before, Miss Burke? No, never before. Do you think you'd know any of the men if you saw them again? Well, I shouldn't be sure. One of them, maybe I might know him. Well, how do you mean? Did you get a look at his yeah, face? Yeah, only it was very quick. 
when they was putting me in the closet, I was hitting and kicking at them. Mm-hmm. One of the men, I knocked his hat off. It fell on the floor. I pulled at the thing on his face, the, the mask. Almost it came off. Well, from what you could see, what did the man look like? The blonde hair, I can remember. It's not so much on top here. It's only on the side here. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was uh, right there by the forehead mm-hmm. here, a scar mm-hmm. going over that way. Yeah. Was he a big man, do you know, as big as the other no, two? No, no, he was a smaller man. He, he was bigger this way, you know, fatter. Yeah. He was so mad when I knocked his head off, I thought maybe he'd kill me. They only put me in the closet, you know, and then they closed the door. I could hear them upstairs going through the Mr. and Mrs. room. And you're pretty sure of the description you've given us, Miss Burson? Oh, yeah, the scar, the blonde hair. Not so much on top, I remember that. It was... Well, I was so much frightened, I thought they'd kill me. Mm-hmm. Now, after they locked you in the closet, they didn't come back? That's the last you saw them? Yeah, they didn't come back to me. I could hear them moving around upstairs, and then I could hear them leave after a while. It was like all night before the Mr. and Mrs. came home and found me. I was so much frightened. This thing wouldn't happen in Sweden. That's where I come from, Sweden. Yes, ma'am. You sure there's nothing else about these men that you've noticed? Uh, something we ought to know about? No, everything I saw, just what happened, I told you the way it was. This never would have happened in Sweden, not like this. These robbers like this. Burglars, ma'am. Yeah, these burglars. I thought I'd be dead. Never would happen in Sweden like this. You mean you don't have burglars in Sweden? Oh, yeah, yeah, we have burglars. Well, then just how do you mean, yeah, ma'am? We have burglars, but they don't break in the house when somebody's there. They're a little bit gentlemen. Is that so? Yeah, they wait till everybody's going from the house. Then they break it. Even burglars should be gentlemen a little bit. Before we left the house, we checked with the owners, took their crime report, and a list of their stolen property, some $6,000 in jewelry and fur coats. The maid's description of one of the three men in the gang wasn't complete, but it was the best that we'd had on them in three months. Frank Cunningham and the Eye Bureau had the description of the scar on the suspect's forehead checked through the oddity file. Meantime, Ben and I paired up the additional facts about the suspect. The scar, the color and condition of his hair, along with his general description, his approximate weight and height. We had the stats office make a run for us and all ex-cons with burglary records who fitted the overall description. They came up with a list of ten names and we started checking them out. One of the first listed was a Russell Snow. We checked his last known address, but he'd moved. His mail was being forwarded in care of his brother, George Snow, who managed the Neptune Plunge, a public indoor swimming pool in the East Hollywood neighborhood. We drove out to interview the brother. Pretty good size for an indoor pool, huh? Yeah, it is. It's a nice layout they got. Must be the office straight ahead there. Hey, Joe. Joe, look. What's that? That girl over there, look at that bathing suit she's got on. Yeah, they keep getting smaller, don't they? Makes you embarrassed just to look at them. Yeah, maybe I'm just getting old. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, sir? We're looking for George Snow. Yeah, I'm him. Police officers, Mr. Snow, like to talk to you a few minutes if we could. Oh, yeah. Hey, let me grab a towel over here and get right off, though. Sure. Come on over. Pull up one of these deck chairs here. All right, thanks. thank you very much. Well, what is it, officers? What can I do for you? You have a brother, isn't that right, sir? A Russell Snow? Yeah, that's right. Russ is my brother. Anything wrong? Well, we'd like to locate him if we could. Do you know where we can find him? No, I don't think I can. Last I heard from Russ was about six months ago. Said he was going to take a job in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. Not in trouble again, is he? Not that we know of. We'd like to locate him, that's all. I don't think I can help you much. Russ isn't much of a letter writer. Only time I hear from him is when he's in town. We've checked at the last place your brother was staying. They told us he left word to forward all his mail here to you. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Russ asked me to take care of it. No letters have come through so far, though. Mm Mm-hmm. Were you to hang on to his mail or send it on to him in Minneapolis? No, I was going to hang on to him. Russ said he'd picked up his mail next time he was through. As I say, that was six months ago. I haven't seen or heard from him since. Then you wouldn't know if he was actually in Minneapolis or not. Well, no, I wouldn't. Guess you know my brother Russell had a police record. Yes, yeah, sir, we do. He had that trouble a couple of years ago, that burglary rap. I think Russ learned his lesson. Are you your brother's only living relative? I mean, is there anyone else in town who might have heard from him? Well, I don't know, officer. Excuse me just a minute. All right, kids, no running around the side of the pool, you hear? You slip and break your neck. No more running. Sorry, I gotta watch Michael Hawk. Yes, yeah, sir. Well, like I was saying, I can't think of anybody who might have heard from Russ. I'm his only relation, but he does have a few friends around town. 
I mean, legitimate fellas, you know. Yeah, uh-huh. They come around once in a while, drop in and say hello. Have any of them heard from your brother? They might have, but I didn't ask them. It was old Matt Garson. He's a good friend of my brother's. He was in the other day, but he didn't say anything about hearing from Russ. Might be that he has. Maybe he didn't think to mention it. Where does this Matt Garson stay, do you know? I really couldn't tell you, officer. Matt's a real character, kind of a floater. Doesn't stay with one job more than two months. Like last week when he was in here. Yes, sir? He's a real pitchman. Gave me a big sales talk. Biggest bargain on earth. Said he'd sell me a couple of them real cheap. I didn't have any use for them. What's that, sir? Fur coats. Before we left, George Snow gave us a complete description of Matt Garson together with the names of five of Garson's acquaintances who might know of his whereabouts. When Ben and I got back to the city hall, we checked Garson's name and description through R&I. He had a record of two fairly recent arrests, but no convictions. Both arrests were for suspicion of burglary. We checked on Garson's last known residence. He'd moved. No forwarding address. His last place of employment was listed as the Park Tivoli nightclub out on Wilshire Boulevard. The Park Tivoli was one of the six places that we'd staked out as a possible working ground for the burglary gang's finger man, a place where he could spot expensively dressed persons, check on their home addresses, and line them up as future burglary victims. Ben put in a call to the manager of the Park Tivoli to check on Garson's employment. What was that, sir? Last July. Mm-hmm, I see. Well, yes, sir, we'll probably be out tonight. Right, thank you. Bye. What'd you get? Garson worked out there, all right. Parking lot attendant. He quit last July. Mm-hmm. If he's the guy checking off the customer's furs and jewels, he's in a perfect spot. Yeah. Manager told me that Garson has a girlfriend. She still works at the club. Might be the answer, Joe. Well, how do you figure? She runs a hat check stand. You are in the communications division of a Metropolitan Police Department. The teletype room. Forty-three LOS five twenty-nine fifty-one, twelve o three p.m. APB. WMA one fifty five foot six, dark hair, dark eyes, wearing gray suit, no hat. Suspect is wearing glasses. Heavy build, twenty-two years. Suspect is armed with blue steel revolver. Any information? Forward. You have just heard a teletype description of a suspect. This information will apply to many, but careful screening will eliminate all but one. You'll find the same is true when you examine king-size cigarettes. Yes, careful screening will eliminate all but Fatima. Compare Fatima. Fatimas are the same length as any other king-size cigarette, 85 millimeters. Fatima has the same circumference, one and one sixty-fourths inches around. And Fatima filters the smoke exactly the same long distance as other king-size cigarettes. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. Fatima gives you extra mildness, a much different, much better flavor and aroma. You get all the advantages of extra length plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. So compare Fatima yourself. Your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Buy Fatima. Best of all, long cigarettes. One of the biggest problems that faces a police officer working the burglary detail is not only apprehending the thief, but also recovering the stolen property. Dozens of criminals of this type will spend 5, 10, or even 15 years in prison if they know that on their release they will have a stake of thousands of dollars in stolen property which they've hidden somewhere to start over again with. Thursday, January 26th, 5 p.m. We got out a broadcast and an APB on the burglary suspect, Matt Garson. Then we began checking back on his girlfriend, Virginia Ramsey, who worked as a hat check girl at the Park Tivoli nightclub on Wilshire Boulevard. It was one of the six probable places where we thought that the finger man for the burglary gang was lining up potential victims. Despite the fact that she often associated with known criminal suspects, the Ramsey girl had no previous criminal record herself. That night, after she reported in for work at the club, Ben and I checked her apartment. In one of the closets, we found three expensive fur coats. They were all identified as property taken in previous burglaries by the gang. In a strong box in the desk, we found a half a dozen pieces of expensive jewelry also identified on the stolen property list. Ben and I got in the car and drove to the Park Tivoli nightclub. Your hat, sir? 
Check your hat. Your name Virginia Ramsey? Yes, that's right. Police officers, Miss Ramsey. I'd like to talk to you downtown. Beg your pardon? I say we're police officers. Here's our identification. I'd like to talk to you downtown. What's it all about? I haven't done anything. Then there's no reason to worry. We'd just like to ask you a few questions, that's all. What about? A man by the name of Matt Garson. I understand you know him quite well. No, I don't know him. I don't even know what you're talking about. Want to get your coat, Miss Ramsey? We'll talk it over downtown, huh? I'm working now. Listen, I won't be off till 2 o'clock. I can't just walk off the job. We'll just talk to the manager. He's going to have one of the other girls take your place. Do you want to get your coat, please? All right. You sure you checked with the manager? I don't want to lose my job leaving like this. We talked to him. It's all right. This way, please. Out the side door. I'd like to know what this whole thing's all about. I think I have a right to know pulling me off a job like this. We told you, Miss Ramsey, it's about a friend of yours, Matt Garson. He used to work here at the club, didn't he? I wouldn't know. A lot of people work here. I don't know them all. Why should you want him, anyway? Do you know him? I think I might, yes. I'm not sure. Why do you want him? For interrogation. Just like to ask him a few questions. Why? Are you ready to admit that you know Garson? I think I might. Yeah, I know him. Want to get in, Miss Ramsey? I still don't know what it's all about. Why do you want Matt Garson? Same reason we want you, suspicion of burglary. You don't know what you're talking about. You can't prove anything against me. We already have, miss. Huh? We found three fur coats in your apartment. There was some jewelry there, too. Those things are mine, every one of them. They're all mine. All right, come on, you're wasting time. They're stolen property, you know that. How about it, miss? You want to tell us about Matt Garson? Where is he? Told you. Told you the first time. Yeah? I don't know him. 10 p.m. We drove the suspect, Virginia Ramsey, downtown to the city hall and took her to the interrogation room. We questioned her continuously until well past midnight. She refused to admit anything. We gave her time to rest a little and sent out for some food. Then we resumed the interrogations. 2 a.m. The Ramsey girl still refused to admit any connection with Matt Garson, his friend Russell Snow, or any members of the burglary gang. We stayed with it. By 4 a.m., we'd halfway convinced her that protecting the members of the gang wasn't the answer, that the best thing for her to do would be to cooperate. 5.30 a.m. Can I have a cigarette? Yeah. yeah. Here you are. I'll tell you about it. I know Matt Garson. He's one of the gang. You know where he is? No. He got me into it. He made me do it. There wasn't anything else I could do. What did he make you do? Well, when I was checking coats and things at the club, I was supposed to watch for customers with money, expensive furs and jewels. I found out who they were, and then I'd tell Matt. He'd tell the others. Who are the others? One of them's Johnny Lang. There are a couple of others, but I don't know their names. Believe me, Sergeant, Matt made me do it. He got me into it before I knew what it was all about. When I found out, he threatened to frame me if I didn't go along with him. Do you know where any of these men live, where they hang out? No. None of them, not even Matt. Ever since he moved, he wouldn't give me his new address. Do you think Garson will try to contact you at your apartment in the next few days, maybe? No, I don't think so. Not until after the next job. They're waiting on it now. They've been watching the house. Which house is that? Place out in West Hollywood. Wealthy people. They were in the club about a week ago. And the gang's waiting for them to go out some night and leave their valuables at home, is that yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. Matt says it's an easy house to break into. He thinks it ought to be a cinch. Matt ought to know better. Huh? It's the easy ones you trip over. Before we booked her in on suspicion of burglary, Virginia Ramsey gave us the name and address of the people in West Hollywood who were supposedly the next victims on the burglary gang's list. Later in the morning, we drove out to see the people. A Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Thornson told them the story and laid out our plans, which they agreed to. That night, the Thornsons left their home a few minutes before nine. They were simply dressed, no furs, no jewels. At 9.35, three men scaled a fence at the rear of the Thornsons' home and broke in through a side door. Right behind them was a detail of a half a dozen officers who moved in and made the arrest. The three suspects were taken downtown, where they were identified as Russell Snow, Matt Garson, and Howard Ferris. We searched their apartments, their cars, and garages. There was no trace of the stolen property. 
Each of the men were brought to the interrogation room separately for questioning. Matt Garson was the first. He denied any knowledge of where the loot was hidden. That's the truth. I don't know where the stuff is. I work for the outfit, that's all. You've been working for three months without a payoff. Is that what you're trying to tell her? Well, we haven't been turning over everything we got. We've been holding out half the stuff. Selling it on the side. I just work for the outfit, that's all. That's not the way we get it, Garson. You're supposed to be the big man. You masterminded the deal. Me? Who told you that? Your girlfriend, Virginia Ramsey. We picked her up yesterday. She told us everything. What'd she tell you? You're the big man. It was your idea. You ran the works. What about it, Garson? Big joke, Sergeant. On both of us. What do you mean? You can ask the other boys. They'll tell you the same thing. We can prove it, too. There's only one boss in this operation. Yeah? Virginia Ramsey. <laughs> For a 23-year-old girl, it seemed like a new record of some kind, if it was true. We checked the other suspects, Russell Snow and Howard Ferris. They told us substantially the same story. The Ramsey girl had formulated all the plans and directed the entire operation of the gang since its inception. They insisted that they had no idea where the stolen property was hidden, but they did know that the Ramsey girl had a safety deposit box in a downtown bank. We made a canvas of banks in the downtown area, and a day later, we located the safety deposit box listed in Miss Ramsey's name. We obtained a court order, and the box was open. In it, we found practically all of the stolen jewelry, almost $50,000 worth. Ben and I went back to the main jail, where we had Virginia Ramsey signed out for investigation. We brought her to the interrogation room, where we confronted her with the evidence. I didn't think you'd find out. I didn't think you'd ever find out. How about the furs, Miss Ramsey? I got the key. You can have it. I rented a private garage. I got them stored in there. All of them? Just about, yeah. You picked up the others in my apartment. How'd you manage to run this whole operation? Those men you had working for you, you cut them in for practically nothing. They were experts, the best in the business. That's why I hired them. They were the best. It's too bad. Should have worked out. Too bad didn't go. You had a pretty fair run. Wasn't half bad for me, was it? Only 23? First time I ever tried anything like it. What gave you the idea? I don't know. I wanted things. Pretty smart setup, though, don't you think, Sarge? How's that? Wouldn't you say I played the whole thing pretty smart? Oh, I don't know. You figure it. What? You're in jail, aren't you? The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 28th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 89, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, if you smoke a long cigarette, I want you to get acquainted with Fatima's. This weekend, for instance, when you're relaxing and taking it easy, you'll really appreciate Fatima's better flavor and aroma. And I know you'll like Fatima's extra mildness. Make a note tomorrow. Buy Fatima's in the familiar yellow carton. Twenty-three-year-old Virginia Ramsey, the leader of the gang was tried and convicted on four counts of first-degree burglary and four counts of receiving stolen property. The three male members of the gang were convicted of first-degree burglary, also four counts. They are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. First-degree burglary is punishable by imprisonment for not less than five years. Receiving stolen property is punishable by imprisonment for not less than six months, nor more than five years. Ladies and gentlemen... Vacation time is here again, and a great many of you will be taking trips in your automobile. Danger is never absent from the highways of America. Be careful. The care you take may save a life, and that life may be your own. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Stay tuned for Counter Spy, next over most NBC stations.